Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Reader's Journey podcast. Today, we have Blaz Morris, creator of The Rabbit Hole, which is an amazing website that has over 600 book summaries, along with a lot of other insightful educational material. Blaz, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Blaz, so I'm a big fan of your book summaries. It's a website that I kept stumbling on over and over again, and I became curious, like, who is this guy? Why is he writing so many book summaries? And I wonder if you could kind of take us back in time to talk about like, were you always someone who loved reading or was it something you discovered later on in life? Yeah, definitely something I discovered later on in life. So since I was about 10 years old, I played competitive tennis. So before school, after school, weekends, it sort of took up my my energy, my passion. And sports are weird. I, I played in college and unless you're part of that top 1% and can go pro, you're sort of done from one day to the next. And that was my situation. So I sort of figured what would be my next sport, my next thing? And, you know, it took a couple of weeks to really think through it, but I kind of came to the conclusion that my time would best be spent reading, learning, traveling, uh, meeting fascinating people. So I sort of made that my new tennis. So instead of going to the courts or to the gym, I would go to the library and I would sit and study and read. And it was interesting because it, it was a whole side of myself I had never known. I didn't ever have enough emotional bandwidth or energy, to be honest, to pursue anything besides tennis, really. And now I had all this energy and time and flexibility in my schedule to, to go down those different avenues. So it was something I discovered 22, 23 years old and uh, just turned 30. So call it seven, eight years later. And it's been really fun to explore these new sides of myself and find the edges of my interests and uh, capabilities in that sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that's incredible. And actually quite similar to my story where I thought I wanted to become a professional basketball player. And then I realized it's probably not going to happen. And I channeled all like that energy that I had towards like books. So ju just like a pretty cool similarity but between us there. And mm -hmm. so what made you want to go from just like reading books to actually like writing these summaries and creating the rabbit hole? Yeah, I've always been really pragmatic and not too intellectual, I would say, where it's just the process of learning that gets me excited, but it's really the, the application that gets me fired up. And I knew from the very beginning that I'm not smart enough to just remember everything I read. So I figured long-term, I'm actually saving myself a ton of time by taking these notes because three, five, 30 years down the line, I wouldn't have to reread the whole book. I could return back to my notes and get the gist. And I started doing that for myself and everything you see on the website now, I would still do just for myself. But at some point down the line, I figured, hey, um, other people might benefit from this. And if it saves people from having to read a book that they don't care about, or they at least get a high level overview without having to read it themselves, maybe there's some value in that. And it's been rewarding and fun to kind of go down that journey and uh, yeah, see other people resonate with it. Yeah, and I, I was definitely one of those people, like, yeah, was, like book summaries, I tell people, is a great way for you to remember the information, but also when you share it online, it benefits a lot of people. Like, like personally, I've constantly went back to your book summaries, and it's great that it helped you, but also helps other people. So it's like a, you know, win-win situation for everyone. Absolutely. And it's this idea of leverage through code, right? I do that one time, and I can share it forever and infinitely. And I've learned a lot throughout that process, sort of learning in public and, uh, you know, the website's really rudimentary and simple, but it taught me how to put up a website and deal with WordPress and, uh, you know, some very basic coding skills. And that's helped me with a lot of other projects down the line. And for me, that's been such a, an interesting point that everything you learn comes back to help you in some way, shape or form. And you might not know when or how, but following that curiosity and understanding that these skills, this knowledge will help you, will benefit you, will improve your life and the lives of others. At least for me, that's what keeps me so curious, whether it's, you know, something really esoteric and idiosyncratic, or it's kind of one of the, the new bestsellers everyone is talking about. It, it will come back to help at some point, And that drives, drives me to keep learning. Right. Yeah. And I think, yeah, if you just follow your curiosity and just try to prove a little bit each day, like you talk about your website, It'll definitely over time when you look back you'll see like this huge change in your life i'm sure you see that as well throughout your reading journey from uh, you've been doing this for over five years is that correct yeah you know let's call it seven years or so oh wow awesome and so you've read hundreds and hundreds of books and there are like millions of books out there so how do you decide like what book you want to read next yeah there's this biological principle of exploration versus exploitation and try to turn back to that whether it's business or work or investing or friends or reading but 
there's this blend of chaos and order of serendipity and sort of planning that I think is healthy. And it's a little different for each person, but there's a decent amount of serendipity in there where I come across a title or a person or a concept that just speaks to me for whatever reason. And I buy the book and just dig into it right away. But the other half of it is, uh, you know, Amazon wish list and a close group of friends. I recommend books. And if it comes up two, three, four times, then I just bite the bullet and, and order it. So it's that it's that blend between things just popping up and other people recommending. Yeah, and I think that's uh, great advice. Like, yeah, if I constantly get see a book that's constantly being recommended to me by people I trust or admire, it's like chances are that book's worth reading. And so I get your monthly uh, newsletter where you kind of do a recap of all the books you read that month. And I know it's, it's like consistently you read like anywhere from five to like 10 books. And, you know, that's a lot of books to read in a month. So I'm curious, how much time do you spend reading like each day? And how do you find so much time to read? Yeah, it's probably the the question I get most often, Alex. And people think it's some superhuman effort and you're out on the outside looking in and it looks crazy. I, I understand that. I get that. But I can tell you sort of being on the inside and being the one doing it, it's not crazy. There's no superhuman effort. I sleep seven to eight hours a day. I have an 18-month-old daughter. I have a full-time job. I have a couple other projects. Really, it's just setting aside an hour every morning and it's pretty sacred, you know, not too many things could get me to, to miss that time. And I think I'm just focused and consistent with it. Again, I, I was never the most talented tennis player. I'm not the smartest person, but I, I think I do develop good skills and good habits. And I just let that play out. And it's a, it's only been seven years, you know, in the grand scheme of, of my life, that's really not that much. And I think that will benefit me forever, whether it remains just reading or writing or other projects, but that consistency day in, day out is for me what's made the biggest difference. Yeah. And I love how you share is like there's no like super secret hack, like you're not speed reading all these books. It's really just making the time to read and focusing while you're on that time. It's not like you're reading and you have your phone in one hand. It's like you're, if you're spending that hour reading, chances are you're fully focused on that book. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And, you know, I, I make connections and I write in the margins and I have a conversation with the book, with the author, if you will. And if, if the book doesn't draw my attention enough for me to be willing to put down my phone, then it's a problem with the book or the, my interest in that topic. And I either switch to something else or change tasks. There's no, for me, there's no point in sort of brute forcing this where I'm doing it for my own good, my own enjoyment, right? It's not for a grade. Nobody's quizzing me on this. There's no external validation. So I've gotten much better these last couple of years where something doesn't capture my attention. I just move on, right? There's a, a bit of sunk cost in that, but much, much better to move on to something else that really does pull you in. Yeah. And that's such a wonderful piece of advice because I feel like too many people, they remind themselves of school where it's like you're assigned the book and you have to read this book. But yeah, like, like you just shared, if a book isn't interested or if you aren't interested in a book, it's okay to quit it because there are literally thousands, if not millions of other books that you'll enjoy a lot more than the one you're currently reading. Uh, so that's a great piece of advice. And you mentioned you take notes while you're reading. Uh, I was wondering if you could kind of share a little bit more about your note taking process and how you summarize uh, your books. Yeah, absolutely. There's no super secret formula here either, Alex. It's uh, things, you know, I'm sure you've read about and do yourself, but Throughout the process of reading, I take notes and highlights in the margins, and I summarize everything in the kind of the cover page, the front page of the book. And if there's something that's worded beautifully, I refer back to the page and sort of copy word for word. And sometimes it's worth uh, not paraphrasing, but getting it exactly right. And once I finish the book, I type up all those notes into my Evernote. And what you see on the website is basically a copy and paste from my Evernote to the website. There's some personal stuff I remove them. Uh, but for the most part, that's exactly it. There's no really, you know, advanced software. There's no incredible process. Again, it's simple things, but you know, this beautiful idea of uh, take a simple idea and take it seriously. I think that system is a testament to that idea. Yeah. And that's wonderful because I, I feel like right now people are saying like, oh, you need like a software like Rome or Obsidian or something other like super complex note taking app. But it's like, it's okay if you just use Evernote and just write out the summary. It's like the best system that works is the one that works for you. And I, I'm just super happy to hear that like, like you just use, you know, you know, uh, Evernote and like you just copy and paste it to your website and it works uh, for you and it doesn't have to be super complex. I think that's right. And it depends what you're optimizing for, right? I think Rome and some of these other tools can do a good job of 
visualizing it or creating interconnections that might not be obvious to you. And, you know, Evernote has a lot of limits around that. And uh, we could talk about some of that too, but you're right. It, it doesn't need to be this really complex thing. Um, in fact, often simpler, the better. And trying to refine my process over time and still looking to do that where it's not unnecessarily complicated. And if it does require a little extra effort that it's worth it. Mm, got it. And when you are reading, is it like only print books or eBooks or audiobooks, or is it a mix? Like, how do you read your books? I prefer physical. Um, and as much as possible, I do that for the reason we just said, where you can just write in the margin so much easier and you can flip back and forth. And, you know, you recall something from 20 pages ago in Kindle, it's really hard to do that audio, same thing, but there's definitely a time and place when I'm driving, I have a couple of books I listen to, and it might be something that I want to re-listen to. And then I have these core ideas in my head already. And it's just a, a refresher, if you will. And eBooks, I, I do as well, kind of before I go to sleep, read a little bit then. And um, it's a little bit simpler to, to do that compared to a physical book. But at the end of the day, I think the process of using your, your own writing and putting it in your own words is really powerful. Mm. Yeah, to totally agree with you there. And yeah, like, like you mentioned, like each uh, book medium kind of has its pros and cons. So you kind of want to you know, experiment with each one. And uh, also similar to you, I just love print books because it's so much easier just to write and take notes. And then also, once you have all, the, all of these notes, are you like reviewing them monthly? Like how do you kind of use your own book summaries to your advantage? So at the end of the month, once I've kind of finished my books and it's time to move them from Evernote to my website is the time that I review those books. So it's a good refresher. Uh, I try to bolt things and make what I think are some of the most important points from that book stand out. And that, again, it just cements these ideas for me. So really it's selfish. And then it's just a lot of people can hopefully benefit from it too. And at the end of the year, I use the whole month of December to review everything I've read uh, in that year. So it brings back these ideas. It helps me make connections. And it's a chance to step back and get an overview. And that's been really helpful for me. And something that took a while to learn is I left to my natural devices, I would just sprint all day long, if that makes sense, and on to the next one and on to the next one. And for me, taking a moment to step back and pause and get a big picture overview and make sure that I give myself space, uh, a break to make connections, to think about things a little bit deeper has been more beneficial than reading the marginal book. So I think as I move forward, I'll incorporate some more of those pauses in my schedule to take a week or a month out of, uh, you know, the daily grind of, of work and to just step back and reflect a little bit more. Yeah, I just I love what you just shared right there. And I'm definitely going to incorporate that into my life, uh, just doing like a yearly review to see like what all the books you read and kind of which one had the most impact on you and kind of also just spending that extra time to reflect on the most important lessons. Uh, so definitely something I'm going to incorporate in my like reading life now. So thank you for sharing that. And so on your website, you share, you know, you have hundreds and hundreds of book summaries, but you also have a subsection called uh, books worth rereading. And it's only like a few dozen books in there. So what, what are these books that kind of make that, uh, that kind of separate the good books from the books worth rereading? Like, how do you describe those books? They're books that have had a tremendous impact on me in one way or another. It could be relationship wise or philosophy or business or investing, but for some reason it struck a chord with me. And over the years, that's a list I review too, where at the end of the year, I might think this book merits being on that list, but then I revisit it in a year or two years and it's sort of fallen by the wayside. So it's kind of this continual culling process and making sure that these books really remain top of mind. And some of it is, pretty straightforward and pretty common, I would say, and others are more esoteric and not on too many other reading lists. But I found that a lot of kind of early to mid 1900s business books really speak to me. The, the language is really simple. Uh, you know, it's people like uh, Henry Ford and Mr. Firestone and the way that they talk about their business is just so crisp and clear. And I, I really enjoy that. And of course, Rockefeller falls into that as well. But those are books that I re-listen to a lot. They're all books that I have on Audible, uh, have them on Kindle, have physical copies. And once in a while, it's worth re-listening to one of those rather than kind of finding that that new shiny thing that you think um, you're excited about. But revisiting those classics is often as beneficial, if not more so. 
Oh yeah, I totally agree. Like there's the books that change your life have so much great information. Like you can't consume it just the first time around. It's like a great movie. You have to watch it multiple times or you have to read this book multiple times to get out all of the gems in it. And I love that you have that section. And it's definitely like when I'm looking for a book to read, I go to that section first to see like what is Blas highly recommend and then, you know, add it to my like book wish list. I appreciate that. And, you know, Epictetus had the line that no man steps into the same river twice. And it's one of these things that people always ask, you know, what are some, some of your favorite books? And it's a very fair question. And as important or interesting, I think, is what other books did you have to read to make that book stand out to you, right? Because the phase of life that you're in, the mindset that you're in, what you're dealing with, problems or, you know, good things, um, all those things impact kind of the state and if you're ready for a book or not and revisiting it, you're naturally going to be in a different spot, right? And sometimes some parts of it will stand out more than others. And that to me also took a little bit to learn where it felt like rereading was a waste of time, right? The whole point of taking all these notes was so I didn't have to reread. But at the end of the day, if it really is something that's worthwhile, it is spending, it is worth spending that extra couple hours rereading the book revisiting it and um it's amazing how often it does pay off yeah and i love that piece of advice like i'm trying to incorporate more like rereading of those gr great books or books that changed my life into my reading schedule and it, because it kind of gets addicting until like hey let's read the new shiny thing that's out but yeah it's so important to just take that time to reread those books that had a huge impact on you and Blas, so we've been talking a lot, about, a lot about books and like I consider you like as a professional reader. Uh, so I was wondering if you have any other like reading tips you could share with listeners or advice for people who are just discovering uh, their love for books. I think Nabal said it cleanest and it's read what you love until you love what, until you love to read. And I think that's correct. Uh, there's no right place to start and it's a personal journey. Like everything else, you figure out these things that really speak to you and it might be sci-fi, it might be comic books, it might be research papers. It, it doesn't really matter, but it ties back to, I think, what we we're saying earlier, where if you have this faith and kind of this idea that everything you learn will benefit you at some point, it really doesn't matter all that much where you start. If you're curious about it and it, it speaks to you and it sparks you, then great, you know, start there. And that'll open up other fields where um, you might not be comfortable with some of these ideas or topics today, but you can, uh, you have the confidence and the interest to, to dig into it. So, yeah, I think listen to what interests you and that'll open up a lot of doors. Yeah, it's such a simple but yet effective piece of advice because if you just follow your curiosity, it's like you're never going to be bored with reading because you're always interested in the next thing you're reading. So yeah, that's a wonderful tip. And so your website is filled with book summaries, but there's also a lot of additional like educational information. Like you have these uh, reference guides and essays. Uh, can you share a little bit about what they are and why you write them? Let's start with the reference guides. So we talked about this idea of exploration versus exploitation. And to me, these reference guides are exploitation, if you will. It's an inch an inch deep, but sorry, an inch wide, by, but a mile deep. And there are topics or people or um, fields that I find fascinating for whatever reason. And, you know, Paul Graham, Walt Disney, um, Edward Tufte, these are the types of people that sort of speak to me. And some of them I knew nothing about before starting, and I randomly read one of their books and was really drawn. And then I read another and another and another, and it sort of created this um, deep rabbit hole, if you will. And it warranted spending a month or a couple months to really get a good grasp of this person or this idea. And complexity science is, a, is another one, and platforms is um, another concept that has spoken really deeply to me. And it's it's impacted a lot of how I think about life and work and investing and um, what I do day to day. So those teachers reference guides, it's, you know, I, I think a lot of books deserve to be blog, blog posts. And what I'm attempting to do here is to make multiple books into a blog post, right? So opposite and um, people's time is really valuable. So how do we condense and synthesize and bring forth some of these really key concepts that might take someone like me a couple months to derive and get towards, but if I can, explain that clearly and thoughtfully to others, then I think I'm adding a little bit of value. Yeah, totally. And I think, yeah, a lot of books, sometimes they have like this fluff or, you know, they could be a lot shorter. And with your like guys, you kind of have like this huge amount of wisdom to words ratio. And it's just like filled with like golden nuggets and wisdom. And uh, you also have a ton of essays on your website. And one that really resonated with me is titled uh, The Infinite Game. I was wondering if you could share like a few lessons from that. Would love to. So 
again, going back to me being a tennis player and I went to Notre Dame, which is supposed to be this, you know, nice prestigious school. And it is, don't get me wrong. And the resources we have are top notch. It's just incredible. And even with all that, as a good student, someone who's organized and kind of on top of things most of the time, that whole process of senior year, finding a job, next step, you know, this part of your life that's been a deep part of your soul and your identity for a decade or more is gone. And it's very strange. It's a really, really strange transition period. And this essay is something I wish I had been given at that point in my life. And it's geared towards student athletes just because that was the the mindset I was in, and you sort of have to pick an audience to write something. And I hope it appeals to a broader audience than that. But it's these concepts that I wish I had known a little bit clearer that somebody would have sat me down at that time and sort of walked me through. And, uh, you know, talking about these different facets of your life that are worth being really clear about. And the ones that I defined for myself were your health, your family, your work, community service, spiritual growth, whatever that means and looks like to you, and then personal growth. And again, we're, we're coming back to a lot of similar ideas, Alex, but none of this is rocket science. You don't need an executive coach. You don't need a fancy software, but it's hard as hell, let me tell you, to sit down for weeks at a time to try to define what those facets are for you and what success in each of those looks like. It's hard. Um, and you have to confront some things and if you're honest with yourself and you say, look, my ego wants a certain title or a certain paycheck, it's not necessarily something to be ashamed of, but at least be aware of it and don't, don't hide it under the table and pretend like it's not there. Reach that milestone. And if it's something that you're really open about and working towards, you might find that either exposing it sort of gets rid of some of the luster that it had, or you reach it and you just move on to the next thing. But it takes time. Don't get me wrong. You you sit down with your thoughts, pen and paper, and you think through what does a healthy version of me look like? Okay. And what steps one through three to help me get there? Okay. We got that. Now let's move on to family and friends and work. And, you know, it, again, it, it takes a lot of time and it, it takes thought. It's hard. <laughs> it's simple, but not easy, as they say. Yeah. And I, I think uh, just a couple important points you just talked about. It's like when you're in college, it, all they focus on is like what job do you want but like what you mentioned is like life is so much more than that it's like what career do you want what kind of health uh, lifestyle do you want what kind of family and community do you want and i think especially since like you said is your the essay was geared towards student athletes and uh being myself a student athlete i found it incredibly valuable and just a couple uh lessons that i really uh pulled away from it was like the importance of compounding which we mentioned earlier and just starting earlier and also, just like how a lot of athletes have a coach, you know, in the sport they play, it's so important to have like a coach or a mentor in life. And like that is just, you know, for anyone listening, even if you're not a student athlete, if you are in college, you should definitely check out the essay because it's just filled like with wonderful advice. Thanks, Alex. I, I appreciate that. And yeah, there's there's so much. And the title of it, the The Infinite Game, it comes from this realization, at least for me, that all these skills and habits and routines and, uh, you know, the way that I was training since I was 10 years old, it directly impacted and helped me in that next stage of life. And sometimes that's hard to see, right? Like how does improving my serve or my volley help me in life after tennis? It doesn't directly, but it's the process of failing and getting back up of understanding, you know, exposing your weak spots and seeing where you need to improve no matter what you do, that process is helpful. And it's really centered around self-awareness and, um, self-compassion in a bunch of ways, right? If you beat yourself up too much, you're never going to reach your, your full potential. So that's a big part of it. Um, but yeah, these skills, these skills really transfer over. It's your job after you finish your sport to understand what those skills are and where you want to apply them next. Right. And, and just for uh, people who like haven't read the book, uh, can you kind of share what the title of The Infinite Game means? Sure. So James Carr wrote this really beautiful book, Finite and Infinite Games, and it's worth reading and rereading it. It falls into that category we we're talking about, at least for me. But really high level overview, a finite game is something that you play to win. It's sports. It's most people's jobs in most situations. And much of life is structured around that. And it leads a lot of the time to this zero sum mentality where, Alex, if you win, I lose and vice versa. And that creates a lot of competition and a scarcity mentality, if you will. The reason that the infinite game spoke to me is it's this idea that you play for the sake of playing, that there is no win or lose necessarily. You're enjoying the process and um, it opens up this abundance. It opens up this win-win mentality where 
I have an idea and I share it with you. No longer do I have no ideas and you have an idea. We, we both have it, right? So it, it opens up this whole new world. And yeah, it's had a profound impact on me and how I think about things and as much as possible, try to structure my life and my thinking and what I do in that infinite game mentality where how can I help others win uh, alongside myself, right? And it's important that I win. It's not a, it's not a martyrdom. I'm not putting myself out there to, um, to feel like I'm losing all the time for the sake of other people. That's not the point at all. You have to win as well, but you can be clever and structure things in such a way so that everyone ends up better off. Yeah, it's such an important mindset to have and like kind of just reframing your uh, perspective on life in general, I think is uh, valuable. And you also have this great essay called uh, The Opportunity Paradox that's filled with uh, a lot of uh, wonderful advice as well that may sound counterintuitive at first, but actually makes a lot of sense once you kind of dive into it. So I was wondering if you could share a couple lessons uh, from there. Yeah, I found paradox to be a really rich place to play, uh, to think about. And there's this other idea um, within the lattice work that we'll get to in a little bit, but this concept of advantageous divergence, right? And it's been, um, you have to be contrarian and correct, as Peter Thiel would say, and Howard Marks has this little two by two grid where, again, you have to be correct and different, really, to have outsized returns, right? And this advantageous divergence gets at the same idea. And for me, paradox is a really interesting place to try to find some of those things where you hear it first off and it, you dismiss it, right? Because it, it's paradoxical. How can that be? But if you can find a way to dissolve and integrate that paradox, you can arrive at something really profound. At least that's the little rabbit hole that I'm going down, right? So this essay for me was a way to explore some of these paradoxes. And for some, win-win might seem like a paradox, right? You've grown up in this scarcity mentality and you're an athlete like I was or whatever. And the only thing you've ever experienced is I win or I lose. There's no, there's no, there's no different plane or different ground to be on. It's, it's all the same. So maybe that's one, but this idea of reciprocation might be another, right? Where the more I give, actually, the more I get. And a lot of these things are really hard because of the time frame that most people operate on, right? If you want something immediately, the best thing to do is just to take it, right? Um, you and I are dealing with each other. I'm just going to screw you over and take, take what is mine and move on from there. But if you can realize that life is a series of iterated games, that it's not just the one interaction that you have, but it's this interaction over a series of interactions over a lifetime, that leads to very different results and very different behavior. And again, for me, I've sort of taken that as a given, or at least I try to. And in as many interactions as I can, try to figure out, again, what that win-win is, right? How do you walk away feeling good about this podcast? How do I feel excited about it as well? And Hopefully some of your listeners and readers benefit too. So it's this beautiful, positive sum game. But yeah, that's what that essay was trying to dig down into is how do we explore and expose some of these paradoxes that might be really valuable. Yeah, and it's, it's just so interesting while we're having this conversation, how much there is like this interweaving of like knowledge and connection. Like you mentioned, those who like kind of give more, get more. And it's also like they're playing that infinite game of like not just a short-term game, but they're playing the extremely long-term game. And you also have this great lesson uh, from your mom where she says um, you need to have like an overflowing cup before you can help others. Can you just kind of uh, briefly talk about that? My mom's a, a beautiful woman. I, I owe a lot to her and she's Swedish. Uh, so I'm, I have a little bit of a different background, but mom is Swedish and dad is Venezuelan. And that clash of cultures really opened my eyes where you have the chaos of the Spanish side and the, the order of the Swedish. And I try to toe that line between the two. But my mom had what I think is a deep and profound lesson that you have to keep your cup full. And what she means by that is, and I, you start to see it everywhere. At least I did when I had this, this visual in my mind, but there are some people who crave attention, who crave love. And it's almost this black hole where no matter how much they get, it doesn't fill anything. And her point is you have to, it might sound a little selfish at first, but you have to start with yourself. You have to feel confident in yourself. You have to have self-love and self-compassion. And the point is, if you don't, no matter who is you know, laying praise on you at that moment, it doesn't do you any good. They stop and then you feel empty again. But if you can feel whole by yourself with nobody else needing to uh, tell you how great you are and lavish praise on you, that makes all the difference in the world. And that's what that filling your cup means. And again, I, I think walking around, you might be able to just look at people and understand if they have 
this overflowing cup where they're there to help other people and give, um, or they're, they're a black hole. They're just craving love and attention from others. Right. And yeah, and it definitely connects to this. Also another lesson in that essay where you talk about like enlightened self-interest, where it's like when you take care of yourself or you take care of your own needs, that's one of the best ways to like help other people. And that's what we've been talking about throughout this conversation is like you write these book summaries to help you, but you also help other people. And you know, it's just a win-win for everyone. So it's just fascinating to see like this internet connection of all these helpful lessons and how they create like this positive feedback loop for your life. Yeah, it's not binary at all. If you're clever about it, you can structure things in such a way so that everyone really does end up better off. And the enlightened self-interest actually came from Henry Ford. And he had such a beautiful idea, which was just so powerful. And it just spoke to me. But his driving force was he wanted to make his cars as cheaply as possible so that the people that worked at the Ford factory could afford them. And that opens up an entirely new market, right? So it was selfish where it would help him sell more cars and you know would make Ford as a, a company and a brand more successful. But by having this maniacal focus on driving down costs and that led to the assembly line and everything else, he benefited everyone. And you know, Ford has his flaws like everyone else does, not not to say he's perfect, but that enlightened self-interest really um, yeah, it's had a, a deep impact on me and how I try to think about things. Yeah, and I just I just love all these paradoxes because yeah, like you say, this, they're so rich and so much room to play. And I just want to cover one more, which comes uh, discipline equals freedom by Jocko Willink. Uh, so can you share like kind of what that means and like uh, explain that par paradox to listeners? Mm -hmm. You probably understand this uh, being an athlete, but anyone who's pursued mastery to a really deep degree understands that discipline is a big part of that. You set, your, you, you set your schedule when you wake up, when you sleep, what you eat, when you practice, how you recover, what you do on certain days. But the point is, you would think that installing that sort of regimen on yourself would limit your freedom. And the point is that once you get those systems in place, it gives you the room and the space to breathe and, and be flexible and creative in every other aspect of your life. And I think everyone sort of has a, a personal spectrum where I probably like habits and routines more than the average person, but that gives me, when I'm in that hour in the morning that is my space to write and think and read, it gives me the space to be free. And I don't have to worry about my phone and I don't need to worry about what I'm gonna eat or what I'm gonna wear or what I'm gonna do. The discipline gives me the structure to be free. Um, and maybe that explains a little bit of that paradox, but I think Jocko did a really great job of highlighting that for me and exposing a very simple, you know, discipline equals freedom. That's a, a very straightforward line, but it, it resonates deeply. Yeah, it's such as yeah, another simple but such important piece of advice because like if you don't have that d discipline, you're gonna be you're gonna let your uh, emotions or like your impulses control you. Meanwhile, you have that discipline where you say every morning this time is for reading, and that's the only thing I'm doing. And like over time, you know, all that reading compounds and it pays off in the long term instead of just like kind of free flowing. I'll read whenever I want to. So yeah, that's, that's just. Right. Uh, yeah, super valuable tip. And so Blas, we've talked about, you know, book summaries, reference guides and essays. And now you're working on a new project called The Lattice Work. Uh, can you tell us, first of all, what does that mean? Because I never heard of that word before until I still stumbled onto your website and kind of uh, share more about the project. I've stolen it from Charlie Munger. And he has this idea of the lattice work of mental models. And his point is that you have to have this crisscrossing of ideas, this structure in your mind where you can hang things, right? And I think we all sort of intuitively get that, right? If you understand one concept or one idea really well, it's easier to understand the next idea by relating it back. And that's where this idea of compound knowledge really takes off, where you have these ideas and a, a solid structure in your head. Each additional thing you read, each thing you're trying to learn, there's a hook in your head for where that might hang. And that to me made all the sense in the world and was so powerful. And I read his, you know, his famous book, Poor Charlie's Almanac, a long time ago. And he has this line that if you know, if you know the big ideas, they carry 95% of the freight. And again, that, that excited me. It's like, okay, yeah, that's a, a nice shortcut to life. How do I get smarter uh, and better quicker, right? That's, that's what I want. And he highlights some of them in that book. But I was surprised to see that there was no resource or community that really focused on that. And of course, Farnham Street does a beautiful job, and they've really kind of mass marketed some of these ideas to bring them um, bring them to light, which is really valuable. But for me, what I think the lattice work could do, the problem it's trying to solve is number one, just curating and organizing what 
I think, what this community thinks are some of these key ideas. So rather than doing you know, hours of research and if you want to understand biology or physics or chemistry better, what are those key concepts and who do I turn to and what resources do I trust and you know, this sort of 80-20 principle across the board. And that's what we're trying to do for our community is bring all those ideas to one place, explain them in a fun and engaging way, and then provide the resources and the people that could help you kind of move to that next level if you should want to go a mile deep in any of these things. Right. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like an incredibly fascinating project. And yeah, like I love, you know, your summaries and your essays and your guides. So uh, really looking forward to that. And like uh, anyone listening, they could sign up on the wait list and you'll be sent to uh, the Worldly Wisdom section, which is a interesting uh, collection of like helpful, like mental models and all these like kind of life concepts for people to follow. And uh, one that really uh, I found fascinating was this idea of first principle thinking. And I really enjoyed uh, also like that video where Elon Musk talks about it and talks about how he used it to like help build a Tesla and SpaceX. Uh, so I was hoping you could kind of expand on what is first principle thinking and how you use it. It would be hard for me to say it better than Elon. So I'll sort of just paraphrase what he said. But in the early stages of SpaceX, everyone told them it was impossible that flights up would be hundreds of millions of dollars. And how would a private company ever be able to do anything like that? And his point was, look, if you look at the metals, the raw materials, the the labor that go into making this, it's, I forget the number, but let's say it's a 20th or a 50th of the cost of what NASA and uh, others are charging at that time. And his point was, look, if we think of the, about this from a first principles perspective, there is no reason that it should be 50 times more expensive than the raw materials and labor to put it together. Now you need a margin and you need profit, so you need to layer that on top. But his point was, this isn't this impossible journey. And that let him see confidently that this was something that was feasible when everybody else was saying no. And I guess to abstract and extrapolate that a little bit, the point is that if you can think from per first principles that you can avoid falling into ideological traps, that you can maybe see things that others think are impossible or unlikely and understand what the, the wedge into that market or into that business or into that opportunity might be when conventional thinking might tell you otherwise. So it's really looking at the raw materials, this fundamental, these fundamental principles that hopefully the lattice work does a good job of explaining and kind of bringing to the forefront of making those tools that you can use to help you become a more effective thinker and, and enrich your life. Yeah, that's definitely what I love about the website when I was uh, looking into it is like, there's so many tools to kind of look at life from new perspective or like one that you just like never thought of. And it's just like valuable, you know, ways to you know, going about your life instead of the traditional way, like use one of these mental models or concepts, and it really opens up your thinking and it kind of opens up opportunities just like it did for Elon, where he realized I could, you know, build reusable rockets or electric uh, cars. So it's really fascinating. And uh, I appreciate that. And yeah. yeah, it's, you know, such a core part of this whole project is that it's pragmatic, that it's practical, there's value in learning things just for the sake of learning. But for me, real success is if we can take some of these ideas and implement them into our own lives, into our careers, into our relationships. And that's where I think the community plays such an important role, where we can hold each other accountable. We're, uh, we're doing calls on specific ideas. And Alex, let's say, just take first principles. Um, we get a little group together. You would bring an example from your own life or how you think about it, and I would do the same. And by sharing different perspectives and points of view, hopefully it leads to a richer understanding of this idea. And it's really helpful because at least for me in my life, and I'm lucky, it's hard to find a group of people where you can sort of nerd out and really like go deep on these ideas. And that's what this community is, is here for. And, um, you know, we're gaining traction and, and we're growing steadily and nicely. So it's exciting to see it come to life. Yeah, that sounds incredible. Definitely a community I want to be part of. And then it goes back to something you mentioned earlier. It's like, uh, you have the sometimes you want to explore knowledge, but sometimes you want to exploit it. And I feel like that's what the community is doing uh, in a positive way, because you're kind of applying what you learned to kind of improve your life. So I think that's a super valuable uh, resource for people. Appreciate it. That's the goal, right? It's uh, and we're trying to take some of these Feynman techniques where to really learn something, one of the most useful things you can do is teach it. And we haven't done this too much yet, but it's on the roadmap where Alex, you might volunteer to say, in a month's time, I want to teach a class on this idea. And it puts a little bit of pressure on you, and you're kind of the, the person leading that discussion. 
and then others again can benefit from your work, your synthesis, your reading. Um, and again, it, hopefully, it's this win-win construct where everyone's better off because of it. Yeah, totally. It's that enlightened self-interest and that playing that infinite game. And <laughs> so there's also like uh, there's plenty of um, lots of like concepts you share there. But one more I really want to tackle is this idea of a second order thinking. Can you explain that to listeners? Sure. So just think of a ripple in a pond. And it's that second, third order effect where it's not just your direct action, but the consequences of that action that are important to take into consideration. And I think a really high level thinker is better to, is better able to do that than those who are not. And you can see the ramifications of your actions, not just the direct cause, but everything that happens after that. And what's so fun about this project for me, Alex, is these ideas really deeply interconnect. And when you can see how systems thinking and second order thinking and first principles thinking, how these things are all tied together, at least for me, it makes it more tangible. It's not just this idea that sounds pretty on paper, but there's a way for me to connect it in my head and better see the connections to real life. Yeah, and I think yeah, just like you, um, I think you talked about in the in the in the article, it's like it's not just thinking one step ahead, but thinking multiple steps ahead, and have those this action affect like the rest of these actions, just like you talked about the ripple in the pond effect. Uh, so I just think there's like plenty of uh, fascinating mental models and these concepts that people should definitely check out. And uh, Blas, so uh, I want to ask uh, my closing question, which I ask all my guests, and this is going to be very interesting to hear your answer because you read so many books. And I was wondering if you could just like name uh, one or two books that had like a major impact on your life and how did those books uh, shape you as a person? It's a tough question, Alex. Um, it's not a book, but I would say Paul Graham's essays have impacted me really deeply. And I think he's a wonderful writer and he has a really unique background as well where art history and computer science and obviously he's deeply fluent in startups. So I think his background makes for really interesting and going back to advantageous divergence, the way that he thinks about things for me was really, really different and really unique. And I appreciate that about him. And it's had a big impact on me and how I think about this project with the lattice work and, and other things in my life. So that's definitely one that comes up. And I would say poor Charlie's Almanac, but I feel like that's a, an easy way out. But let me let me say one more. There's a man named Richard Hamming. He was a, a mathematician and he taught at the, the Naval Institute for a long time. And he has a beautiful book that Stripe Press just republished, which um, is a gift for everyone who joins the lattice work because I think these ideas are are worth spreading. But he does an incredible job. And there's one chapter in particular called You and Your Research, which um, it's somewhat well known today, but you can find just a, a text or a blog post of that online. But what I think is really interesting about that is he would ask his colleagues and friends as, as he was working, what are the biggest problems in your field and are you working on them? And that's something I come back to all the time where, you know, I, I don't, number one, it's, it's difficult to be able to name the hardest problems in your field. That takes fluency just to do, right? The the people who can ask the best questions are typically the most knowledgeable. So that that first step, just being able to somewhat remotely define the best questions, the, be the biggest problems in your field is big. And then the second layer of that is if you understand what those questions are and you're not working on it, then what are you doing, right? Are you stuck in a bureaucracy that doesn't give you the space to pursue it? Are you scared of you know maybe trying to tackle a big problem and, and fail at it? But that that simple dual question has, um, yeah, it's made a big impact on me. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons I love asking this question because like a lot of times people bring up books that like a lot of people haven't men mentioned or heard of, and that's one of the books I, I've, I've seen on the website, but I haven't dive, dive, uh, dive in too deep into it. So definitely gonna look more into it. And uh, just thank you for sharing that. And for all the listeners uh, out there who you know enjoy this conversation, they want to connect with you or learn more about the Last Work Project, where's the best place for them to find you or kind of learn more? Sure, uh, I'm on Twitter at Blas Moros, just my name. Um, the Lattice Work handle is LTCWRK, and that's the URL as well. But we also have the Lattice so we should be pretty easy to find. This is a project I'm really passionate about. We have a pretty incredible community built up already, and. Uh, we're growing nicely every month, and it seems like there are people who are really excited about this. And that was scary for me at the beginning. I didn't know if anybody would care, and it's encouraging that people do. So it's it's really fun, and if you're interested at all in something like this, I'd uh, love to connect with you and talk uh, with you and your audience more about it. 
yeah and for everyone listening we'll have links to everything mentioned uh in the show notes below so you can easily find it check out the website uh check out blast's incredible book summaries uh learn more about the last work project and also his essays and uh, reference guides and uh blast i just want to say you know i really enjoyed this conversation love talking about books with you and uh learned so much and i am sure listeners did too so i just want to say thank you for coming on the reader journey podcast with us today it's my pleasure it's been a win-win it definitely has thank you for listening everyone